Hi, this is uh, European News Weekly. Uh, we've got a special interview, uh, and we've basically got Charles Williams Diggs from Bologna.org, um, an environmental uh, agency uh, or NGO uh, that works in uh, Russia and works in, around the world, actually. Um, now, Charles is very kindly come in today. Uh, the main topic of discussion will be the Gulf oil uh, spill, and indeed, uh, Charles uh, and uh, has put out articles uh, which show uh, basically, that he's uh, investigated the Gulf oil spill, the environmental aspects, the social aspects, and health aspects. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to bring in Charles Williams Diggs. Uh, hi, Charles. Welcome to European News Weekly. Hi, Sean. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, and a big thank you from me also, Charles. Uh, a very big welcome to European News Weekly. Thank you, Jimmy. It's a pleasure. Okay, well, uh, sort of start off. Uh, your your articles are quite extensive uh, concerning uh, what happened in the Gulf and and what have you. And I think probably a bit later we'll probably be getting into some of the little uh, surprising uh, news that you have about it. Uh, but um, could could you just give us a quick, I don't know, dare I say, a, a synopsis or summary of all those articles that you did? Uh, they came in, as I said, environmental. Um, uh, they came in social and they came in uh, health effect uh, uh, sort of uh, topics, if you like. Uh, but would you like to sort of go through those and uh, just sort of give us a, a general overview of, of your impression of what happened and what is continuing, maybe continuing to happen? Sure. That's a, is a wide array of topics, obviously, but I'll try to narrow things down. Um, in general, uh, my feeling from covering the initial spill all the way through until now, five years down the road, uh, is that um, there is a certain lack of communication between not only BP and the community here on the Gulf, which is, you know, 40,000 people who are potentially affected by the spill, uh, and, uh, and which BP was responsible for cleaning up. Uh, but also at this moment, I think a critical lack of, um, uh, how should we say, uh, understandable, uh, interaction between scientists studying the spill uh, and people who live on the Gulf Coast who need to know what's going on. Um, at this particular point, uh, you know, living on the Gulf and being a stone's throw away from it, uh, I'm not sure I'd swim in the water. In fact, uh, I know of several scientists, such as uh, Dr. Ricky Ott uh, and um, a number of others, like uh, Dr. Samantha Joy uh, at the University of Georgia, None of, none of these people will go in the water and none of them will eat the seafood that comes out of here. So we have, uh, uh, we had a, the, the, the initial spill, uh, occasioned, uh, an unprecedented use of the oils, oil dispersant corrects at 9500 and 9527. Uh, which is, uh, it, it's on the EPA's list of approved, um, uh, oil dispersants. Uh, but what's odd about that is that there, that any oil spill in the United States at the moment, uh, is, it, it, the, re the first response requires the use of dispersant, regardless of what the ingredients are. Um, nobody really knew a whole lot about Corexit. Uh, nobody really, uh, it, it's the, the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, ingredients, uh, have been kept as a commercial secret. Uh, the mix of Corexit and crude oil was proved by, uh, by the peer reviewed magazine environmental pollution to be 52, 52 times more toxic than crude alone, uh, which has resulted in or has been connected to, uh, thousands upon thousands of chronic illnesses that have emerged, uh, along the Gulf Coast ever since the spill occurred. Uh, not only among those, not only among those who were first responders, uh, which include, by the way, the military, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, but also, uh, uh, and people associated with the fishing industry, which is the main, and uh, which is the main industry here, uh, who, uh, knowing they were losing a fishing season, uh, lent their, lent their manpower and vessels, uh, to haul skimmers, 
uh, to uh, help clean up the spill any way they could. It was the only way that they could make money during the summer of 2010 and into 2011. Um, the vast majority of people I uh, uh, spoke with back in 2010 who were involved in uh, uh, what were called what was called by BP the Vessels of Opportunity program, uh, that is to say, you know, shrimp boats, uh, crab boats, uh, oyster boats, etc., uh, that helped haul oil booms, uh, helped uh, do in situ burning of oil on the surface. Uh, every single one of every single one of those people. Uh, were hit directly by Corexit, which there were some very, there were some very specific rules about dumping of Corexit from airplane. Uh, it, it could, you couldn't dump within two nautical miles of the shore. You couldn't dump within two nautical miles of any vessel at sea. Uh, and, uh, it's now emerged that not only was Corexit dumped over land, uh, it's also emerged that Everybody that I've spoken with and who I kept in touch with was hit by Corexit uh, while doing skimming work at sea uh, or uh, decontamination work or what have you. Um, since that time, uh, one particular the, the crew of one particular boat that I followed, whose whose health I followed through the initial spill all the way through until last summer, uh, every single one of them died. Uh, of cancer. That was a five-person crew on a lo on a huge, uh, what, what we would consider a very, very large commercial sh uh, shrimping vessel here uh, on the Gulf Coast. It was uh, about a 60-foot uh, vessel, um, which worked for uh, five months uh, uh, with a Norwegian oil boom. Uh, out in the Gulf, uh, uh, rounding up oil. Um, and, uh, when they, when the job, uh, was declared finished by BP and the Coast Guard, uh, each one of these individuals on the boat, from the captain all the way down to the deckhands, uh, began reporting respiratory distress, which then emerged as, as cancer. Uh, and as I say, all of them, uh, the last, the last one passed away about a month ago. Um, we're seeing more and more reports of this across the Gulf, but there is, there is very, very little diagnostic criteria, uh, available, uh, to tie, uh, what, what some doctors are calling Gulf oil, Gulf oil spill syndrome, uh, to any kind of treatment path. So, uh, what you end up with is actually sort of an isolated group of doctors uh, who believe that there is a correlation between the illnesses that we see. And we're talking about, a high, uh, according to... No. What's happened there? Hello? Uh, you're back. Hi. Sorry, you were just telling us about the uh, correlation of the doctors, uh, uh, the isolated group of doctors. Right. Uh, so there's a, uh, as I say, there are a group, there are, there are, uh, there's a group of doctors who are trying to put together a diagnostic criteria to prove that there are health issues associated with the spill. Uh, and this is five years later. Uh, this, this, the, the health issues began, you know, the moment they started spraying corrects it. Uh, really the moment the spill started. Um, and, uh, there are, but one of the big problems here in this particular, uh, area from Texas to Florida is that you have a higher proportion of people who have either bad or no health insurance. Uh, you have a larger group of people who are not online. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, the, another, uh, uh, person who I'll, uh, introduce into the conversation, uh, is a registered nurse from, uh, Tampa Bay, uh, the Tampa Bay area, uh, who's been documenting illnesses, uh, in, in small fishing, fishing villages from Tampa Bay, which is far south of where the oil was admitted to have hit. 
uh, all the way across to Texas and, and into Louisiana. Uh, and uh, um, uh, what she's coming up with is that you know the, these the majority of these people who and when you grow up in a fishing village on the on the on the Gulf Coast, you know chances are uh, you have about a sixth grade education or a high school education and went directly into the family fishing business. Uh, you also don't have uh, internet except for on your telephone. You're not Googling up, you know, what could possibly be wrong with you. Uh, why is it that you have a persistent cough? Why is it that you're coughing blood? Uh, why is it that you have uh, uh, paralyzing migraine headaches? Um, the reason being is because there are there the there are constituents of the mixture of crude and corrective uh, that can that actually eat out portions of your brain. Uh, so another one of the symptoms of people who have uh, corrected illness uh, is uh, short and long term memory loss. Um, you know, all the way down then to the to the to, to the lung. Uh, issues, which have been established recently by a report from the University of Alabama at uh, at Binghamton, uh, which said which uh, which established that there was a that the corexit caused damage to membranes, uh, the membranes and and is a, I don't know the specific scientific terminology. You'll forgive me, but there are li it is linked in my articles um uh that it damages a, a particular membrane uh necessary for processing oxygen both in sea life and humans alike uh so there is an established correlation between uh between corexit and breathing difficulties um if we uh go uh a little further afield from that um you have basically three groups of scientists uh, who are trying to get to the bottom of what's going on at the Gulf, in the Gulf now, um, and how much oil is still left out there. Now, the best possible estimate at this particular point in time is, is that 50 million gallons of oil sank, and it's still out there. Um, the big question is, why did not the subsea microbial community digest that oil? Uh, why was it not metabolized? Why, why were there not uh, huge microbial blooms in places where we would have expected to see them? Um, now, uh, one test uh, or one uh, uh, large, long-running uh, uh, undersea test by Jeffrey Chanton, Dr. Jeffrey Chanton at the University, uh, the uh, Florida State University, uh, found oil, uh, and corrects it and trained, uh, it's something like, uh, uh, 10,000, uh, excuse, excuse me, um, 10 million gallons of oil and trained in sediment. Uh, and he used a carbon-14 testing. Uh, um, oil does not resonate back carbon-14, therefore he determined his results that way. Uh, another was the bathtub ring study, which came from Dr. David Valentine from the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, using different methodology, and he determined that the, the gulf itself in the area around, you know, the, the several thousand square mile area surrounding the Macondo well has something of a dirty bathtub ring, which is oil, uh, accounting for anywhere between, uh, 10 million gallons and 30 million gallons. So there's some margin of error in that study. Uh, but, uh, if we, if, if we still stick with the conservative figure there, we're talking about in the 10, about 10, 10 million gallons of oil that are at the bottom of the sea sunk by Corexit. <laughs> now, the big surprise study, uh, was uh, uh, the study released by Samantha Joy last month. Uh, now, she's probably the foremost independent scientist on the Gulf over at the University of Georgia. Uh, and um, she did, uh, she, she was the only scientist who had a control uh, microbial community north of the Macondo well, which was totally by accident. Uh, she and her team had been studying the behavior of undersea microbes prior to the blowout. 
So she knew what that community looked like uh, before the before the uh, before the Macondo blowout occurred. Um, her expectations were that there would be a huge microbial bloom uh, to compensate for uh, to compensate for well to as a result of uh, 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 hyper repopulation uh, to eat uh, 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 as a result of metabolizing the hydrocarbons, which is something I guess you see in a standard oil spill. Um, what happened was is now five years later she's completed a study. Uh, where uh, she, she used deep sea diving uh, uh, Alvin submarines, uh, took core samples, uh, and after about three years of study, uh, she finally announced that uh, she found 30 million gallons of oil sunk at the bottom of the ocean around the Macondo well, uh, which will remain there. Uh, and continue to blow in with, or not blow in, but continue to be carried uh, in uh, to the shore by currents uh, and will remain in the water cycle and the system cycle here in the Gulf uh, because the Corexit uh, that sank the oil killed the microbes uh, that would have eaten it. So the whole theory of using Corexit to sink the oil uh, that was forwarded by the Coast Guard, by NOAA, by uh, the EPA, and several other fe other federal agencies, uh, uh, to say nothing of BP itself, uh, was was fundamentally flawed from the beginning because they didn't have any testing on what it would do to deep sea microbes. And bear in mind that something like thirty percent of this stuff was deployed underwater at the wellhead, uh, uh, which was a which is a never before tested tech, uh, application of this particular uh, uh, of this particular uh, dispersant. So, um, what you've ended up with now is that uh, you know any time we have a rainstorm here along the the, the Gulf Coast, any time you end up with uh, uh, you know we're we're in we hurricane hurricane season began on July first. We have not had a biggie here since Katrina, or, well, since the one that followed Katrina, Rita, which washed up a lot of oil. Um, and that was just, that, that, that just came from, because that, that just came from, from uh, abandoned wellheads, uh, et cetera. Uh, that was back in 2005, of course, but that just came from abandoned wellheads. There are 4,000 uh, oil platforms operating in the Gulf at this moment. Uh, Several of them, are, you know, a good say twenty percent of them are shut down at any given time, and you have a lot of orphan wellheads. This is a different story. But it, it, this, you know, this, this the, the, what happened in two thousand five proves the ability of uh, a, a, a large hurricane to wash oil inland. Uh, to wash it into the marshes, which are already eroding, uh, on the beaches, etc. Uh, Hurricane Isaac was uh, that was 2012. Well, uh, hold on, 2012, 2013, somewhere there. Best believe it was 2013. Um, that washed up a lot of that, that washed up uh, in a lot of areas of Louisiana after Hurricane Isaac. Uh, the oiling was so thick in the marshes, it looked as if no cleanup had ever taken place. Um, so the big concern is now that you, you, you ha it, it's established that there is crude, weathered crude oil uh, with the Macondo fingerprint at the bottom of the ocean waiting for a large storm. Uh, and it doesn't, it, 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 that, the, there's a, I don't think that's a. I don't think that's necessarily a hysterical fear. Uh, essentially, uh, especially given Hurricane Isaac, which was only a Category One. Uh, Katrina hit, made landfall as a Category Three, uh, and if you had a, a storm of that size, uh, you could you could you could end up with some 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 very severe oiling along the coast and even inland as the water's drawn up into. Uh, the the atmosphere the atmosphere and rained inland um, so you know what would people do to clean up after that and who'd be responsible for it um, you know so uh, 
it, it's uh, it, it, but the fact that there's still that much oil in the system in any case uh, also indicates it will continue to wash up with the currents. It will continue to wash up. Uh, it will continue to wash up and to be deposited on beaches. Uh, it will continue to uh, uh, lay at the bottom of the sea where it is now uh, in uh, affecting uh, the food chain from shrimp to crabs to bullheads to uh, the, uh, to, to dolphins, uh, which have been dying in record numbers, uh, since 2010, um, uh, for, we don't know how long. Um, now that's, that's, that's an independent science, scientific assessment. Uh, what the governments and, uh, government scientific agencies and CP uh, think is all locked up behind something called the National uh, Resource Disaster Assessment, which is due to release its findings. Uh, it was due to release its findings in 2013, uh, but nobody involved with the NRDA procedure uh, is allowed to publish the results. Um, now, I know a lot of people who are inside the NRDA who are getting frustrated because there's they, they have findings that people need to know about. Um, you know, whether or not the beaches should be closed, whether or not we should be eating Gulf shrimp, uh, and, and other seafood, oysters, uh, uh, all the stuff the Gulf is famous for, everything that makes the Gulf, you know, uh, everything that provides the backbone of the Gulf's economic life. Um, that being the case, you know, when are we going to hear from the government? I mean, are we, are we going to have to continue to file Freedom of Information Acts? Uh, requests uh, to get information that we need. Uh, are they? Uh, it, 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 so it's it, it's a frustrating process, and I know that there's a lot of push pull between uh, the the you know, BP, which doesn't want certain information released, uh, the NOAA, which needs to release certain information, but is but is gagged from doing so by because it's you know part of the NRDA. Uh, other scientists with universities here along in, with uh, affiliated with universities along the coast here who are also a part of the NRDA who can't speak openly. Uh, so as I say, uh, you, uh, I, I, to get back to that initial problem. This, in a, in a public relations sense for for BP, this was kind of a perfect area for uh, for a spill of this magnitude to occur. Uh, you're talking about uh, a, uh, a socioeconomic community uh, whose wages are far below the national average, whose internet connectivity uh, and access to uh, news as a whole. Uh, and certainly news about their own communities is very limited. And that's made it very, po that's made it possible for, uh, BP, uh, and others working in its, on its behalf, uh, to keep these, to keep, to keep people who are ill, uh, with post spill, uh, chronic illnesses isolated from one another. So they think they've got a cold. They think they have a cold that's lasted five years. Uh, they think that, well, okay, I've, you know, I, I reached 35 and, and, and now I have migraine headaches that are blinding. Uh, now I have light sensitivity that, you know, well, okay, I, I just need to wear welder's goggles when I go outside. I mean, that's literally been the case. I mean, I, I've, uh, I, I've, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of people and, uh, a lot of the guys who, who have light sensitivity, uh, literally do wear welder's masks. <laughs> uh, to, to, to keep the sun out of their eyes. So, you know, this is, I mean, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people with severe illnesses, uh, severe symptom, uh, severe symptomology, uh, which can't, uh, which, which isn't being covered by insurance and which isn't being acknowledged by any state health department aside from Louisiana. <clears throat> um, so if people in, if people in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, uh, and Texas are ill to the point where they can't work. Uh, they cannot collect any kind of, uh, social, well, social benefits here in the United States. Um, uh, in Louisiana, they won't outright admit that you've been, <coughs> uh, affected by the spill. Uh, but they will, you know, at least string together your symptoms and say, 
okay, well, yeah, obviously these symptoms uh, are uh, make you unfit for you know a nine to five or uh, any kind well a job that would require uh, you to be there every day. Hence, you can collect an unemployment check. So, uh, and also have free medical care on top of it. But uh, they're, they're, they're trying to get any statistical analysis of how many people are on that, uh, on uh, what we call SSI uh, or disability uh, as a result of the oil spill is very, is, is, is very difficult because they don't characterize them as being oil spill, oil spill um, uh, victims. They, you have to go through the, the charts one by one to see, okay, well, this person has uh, uh, his this person's um, uh, red blood cells in his lungs exploded. Uh, this person has neurological difficulties. This person has eyesight problems. This person uh, has cancer, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's all, you know, as I say, based on an individual, you know, based on individual cases in Louisiana, whereas here. Uh, in other, I mean, whereas in other places here, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, et cetera, these things aren't even recognized. So, um, so it's very easy to isolate and intimidate this particular community, which is, you know, by and large given to believing what the government has to say. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, people who watch CNN and Fox News as a primary, uh, primary news sources and, you know, it was back in July of 2010 that Thad Allen and Jan, uh, Jane Lubchenco from NOAA said, everything's safe, come on down, let's go for a swim. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you've really hit some amazing points there. Uh, and, and I couldn't help because of my uh, things I've been involved with with Fukushima, with the activism there, that, mm -hmm. that, that you have the limited local news, uh, you have the intimidation of locals, uh, and of course, all this did happen in Japan as well, except for where the blogging community got together and tried to get, get Japanese people information, Japanese people and translators tried to get information out. So, that, but, but it's amazing uh, what you were saying about the uh, NRDA, uh, which is, as you're saying, the alliance of people that are trying to look into this, and that, that many of them are gagged, as well as the NOAA, of course, and we see that in Japan. And, I don't want to go off topic with the Japan thing, but I just I just wanted to mention that. But one thing I will say, because obviously what what we're talking about here, you mentioned the word insurance, and uh, you mentioned the fact that they're denying medical things. Once again, this is happening in Japan. But but BP settlement recently, nineteen billion. Now, mm -hmm. just in one bit, I want to pull up here where you were talking about the cont continuing contamination of all uh, beaches in one of the most sort of hurricane-y, although you've had it good recently, one of the most hurricane-y sort of areas. So it could be a case that you'll get five oil slicks, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a hurricane season, uh, it, mm -hmm. uh, if worse comes to worst. So, uh, and can you see this 19.8 billion? Uh, you know sort of how much things have cost possibly, although I'm sure that's been uh, kept down as well. Uh, but 19.8 billion, uh, can you just see that being used uh, for the next 20 years, cleaning up oil off the beaches and not really being used to uh, to invigorate the local uh, community and support them? Uh, or do you think that the fact that they're just being kind of paid off with the threat of having you know their uh, their free health care and uh, the, the limited money that they're getting from you know. Well, none of this money is going to actually go into health care. Um, no. That's one thing. I mean, this is all uh, this is all uh, economic and uh, 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 environmental re restimulation for the area, uh, and that's what it's that's what it's supposed to be used for, uh, but. Uh, as one uh, activist in uh, New Orleans put it to me, a guy named Jonathan Henderson who works with the Gulf Restoration Network, uh, you know, this is a time now that we have to be especially vigilant uh, because uh, an enormous cookie jar has just been opened. Uh, and a lot of states are filing claims for things that don't necessarily have anything to do with the oil spill. Uh, he pointed out, for instance, uh, that uh, Alabama, uh, is, uh, wants to use part of their BP allocation, uh, to, uh, build a, 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 a waterfront, uh, convention center. Uh, Mississippi wanted to use part of its money to build a minor league baseball stadium, uh, in Biloxi. 
Uh, these are not things that are related at all, as far as I can tell, uh, to uh, environmental restoration. Uh, nor are they related to they 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 nor are they related to say reinvigorating uh, people who came to BP and said we have lost our entire businesses uh, and our entire livelihoods as a result of your spill. Um, now, if you can go from, say, shrimp fishing to selling hot dogs at a, at a minor league baseball field, uh, that may be some recompense in the eyes of, uh, in the eyes of BP, but that's just, that's, that's not, that's not a, 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 a how should we say, that's not a viable, uh, job transition for, uh, for, for, uh, a, a tenth generation fisherman to take. Um, you know, nor is, you know, going into construction. I mean, what are the, you know, how, how what are we going to do to, to use that money, uh, for, uh, uh, environmental restoration? Now, there are a number of really great projects that, uh, uh, each Gulf state has put forward under what's called the Restore Project Act. Uh, which, which allocates, uh, money to restore, uh, 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 the environment, um, and, uh, determine where there is still oil, determine where there's still weathered oil, um, and, you know, restore, uh, fisheries and fish farms and, and aquaculture and that sort of thing. And, and a lot of that money. Uh, will be used for, uh, would, will hopefully be used for marshland, uh, restoration in, uh, in Louisiana, which is losing, which has been losing pr even prior to the BP spill, uh, losing, uh, wetlands at the rate of, uh, I want to say, uh, about eight, about a thousand some odd square meters a day. Um, that's a lot of marshland and it's interesting to, you know, sort of follow old road maps, uh, from about 2005, uh, when you drive from New Orleans down into the bayous and you, where there used to be, where there used to be road, there is no longer, um, it's just sea. <laughs> you just kind of stop and realize, well, geez, I'm about to drive in the water here on this old highway, uh, because there aren't any, there, there are no wetlands or marshlands left there anymore. Um, but the other st the stipulation that we also have to be careful of in terms of, uh, uh, $18.7 billion, uh, being released is that, that that's $18.7 billion that's going to be released over the next 18 years. Um, it's not a lump sum. Uh, it's not something that's going to be divided between the states, you know, on an equal basis. Uh, or on the basis of the merit of the projects that each state is forwarding, uh, in, uh, in the next, say, six months. Um, it's going to be, uh, as I say, a long drawn out process of almost two decades, uh, worth of writing checks, uh, to the tune of a billion dollars, uh, to be divided among four states. Uh, who's, I, I, who, the, which I assume will be used towards, you know, the continuing of, or the continuation of various restoration projects. So, uh, on the, on, 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 um, on, on a cautiously optimistic side, uh, you know, we'll be counting on people like, uh, the Gulf Restoration Network. Uh, and, uh, the national, the, 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 the branches of the National Wildlife Federation and so on, uh, in this area, as well as the press, uh, to make sure that that money is being spent where it needs to be spent and not spent on baseball fields and convention centers. Um, now I understand that a lot of tourism was lost. Uh, I understand that a lot of, uh, that, and that's a, that's another way of reinvigorating the, the, the local communities. Uh, but if we don't know that the water is even healthy to go into, if we don't know, because we're still pulling up, we still, we're still seeing an absolutely cratered, uh, shrimp harvest. We're seeing a 93% reduction in oysters. Uh, what oysters are pulled up are, are, you wouldn't want to eat them. Uh, I'll just 
put, put it that way. They're very brittle shells, very tough meat. Uh, oysters are real hearty. Uh, typically, you could you could take a you could take an oyster shell and and, and use it as a you know use it as a hammer. Uh, oysters that are pulled up from what are called well oysters that are pulled up from 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 oyster grounds now are uh, have extraordinarily brittle shells. Uh, weird growths on them. Uh, and, you know, as I say, this is what's feeding the rest of the Gulf, rest of the Gulf food chain as well. Um, you know, if the, if the dolphins are still getting sick, uh, if the dolphins are still having reproductive issues, uh, if 50% of the dolphin birth rate is stillborn, uh, in, in, in this area alone, uh, that's a they're a they're a uh, you know how shall we say a, a canary in a coal mine for the for the human population, given the similarities of our organic structure. Uh, they're mammals. They breathe air. Um, they uh, they 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 reproduce as as, as we do. Uh, they uh, they're higher. They, they they have high neurological functioning, uh, and they are. They, 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 they're, they're dying off at rates never seen before. So there's something, there's still something off out there. Um, and anybody, any, you know, from clam, clam and oyster fishermen from, 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 uh, Florida to Louisiana will tell you the same thing that there's just something not quite right about it. it's, you know, it, but despite the, despite the, the, the big sort of propaganda reports of, Hey, you know, Gulf seafoods on a rebound and so on. You talk to individual fishermen and individual fish, fish, distribu fish distribution centers, and they'll say, you know, there's just not something right about the water. So what are we going to do to fix that water? And what are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to do to fix the system? Uh, and, and how, in fact, because there, there are really no baseline structures out there as to what the Gulf looked like before the blowout occurred. What are we going to do to determine what, what, how are we going to figure out what it, what it's supposed to look like? So that, if you take the position of, uh, the, the environmental organization Oceana, which thinks that the Gulf is getting gypped big time, that we're really getting stiffed. Uh, that 18 million, that 18.7 billion dollars is way too low. It should be something closer to 30 to 40 billion, uh, as dictated by the Clean Water Act. Uh, if you believe them and we get 20 years down the road or 18, 18.7 years down the road and find that we, we really, we still really don't know what's going on out there and that none of the restoration projects are going to work or are working or are taking hold, uh, then it might be a, that, that might be a really kind of, it, it, it would be a, an embarrassing and horrible end to this particular settlement. Um, what uh, um, uh, what what makes me uh, what makes me curious is 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 the fact that you know in fact in order to in order to develop restoration projects that are going to have efficacy that are going to actually uh, rejuvenate, not, not just, not just in economic terms, but in environmental terms, uh, what's going on with the Gulf? What kind of environmental redress, uh, you know, will make it, you know, as they say in lawsuits, make the Gulf, Gulf whole again? Um, we need that science that's locked up behind the NRDA. Uh, as well as as much input as we can possibly get uh, from the independent sci the independent scientific community to determine what what are the most restoration what are the what are the most important restoration projects that we need to focus on and you know unfortunately at the moment it's kind of a cacophony and as I had indicated earlier beyond uh, beyond not being able to reach the science that's being t that, that, that's being conducted behind the closed doors of the NRDA, uh, there's very little cohesive agreement uh, up to this point or to date, I should say, uh, between uh, the independent scientists who are working on this, the more more eminent scientists who are uh, who decided not to have anything to do with the NRDA, uh, but whose voices are well respected here, uh, and they are they 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 are trepidatious to speak, 
Uh, each one of them has been through the ringer of, uh, you know, federal government harassment. Uh, so they have a very, very hard time speaking in any kind of unified voice or indeed translating what their studies mean into useful language for people who live along the Gulf. Because at the end of the day, we need two question an questions answered. Is it okay for my kid to build a sandcastle on the beaches out here? And is it okay for me to eat a shrimp, uh, a, a, a shrimp sandwich from shrimp from the Gulf? You know, that's what we need to know. Is there, is, what, is, and as I say, is, 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 if, if, if the, if the, uh, if the independent scientists are refusing to re, or, or cannot reach any kind of consensus and the NRDA is not releasing anything that they have until they deem it useful to release it, um, then the restoration projects are going to be real hard to figure out what need, what is the most important thing to start with? You know, I mean, recovering oil from, uh, you know, five, 6,000 feet of seawater, that's obviously not going to happen. But what are we going to do about, say, the continued, the continued appearance of weathered oil whenever we have a rainstorm here? Uh, along beaches. How are we going to measure the toxicity of what comes up? Is it still toxic? Nobody knows that stuff about weathered oil. You run across a tar ball, it could be benign. You run across a tar ball, it could be, uh, it could be ex extremely toxic. Nobody really knows anymore because there are no official beach patrols going on anymore to dig this stuff up and run tests on it. So, um, uh, uh, back to the, back to sort of the initial question, the, the, the $18.7 billion doled out over a period of 18, uh, 18 years. Um, I think that we need, I think that we need more unified, uh, input from both the, uh, independent scientific community, uh, as well as the, uh, the, those who are responsible for the NRDA who, who, you know, who, supposedly know more than the rest of us do, uh, to determine what the most important projects are uh, to make the environment whole again. Now, granted, the Gulf, the Gulf had serious problems before the oil spill. Um, it, it's been, you know, the, the United States has been doing its, uh, has been doing a lot of environmental dirty work in the Gulf since about 1950. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that was just amplified or masked by the appearance of uh, 4.9 mil million barrels of oil. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, how shall we say reverse engineering that needs to be done to figure out what the worst problems are. Right, that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, I have to say, you know, when you mentioned tourism there, uh, that that sort of brought up to me the fact that WPPLC or Ogilvy Maha, uh, that sort of group of uh, PR companies, um, mm -hmm. and probably others as well who, by the way, also covered up the Fukushima disaster. Don't want to keep harping <laughs> on about it. Um, well, how much of the money of that, aid, uh, of, that of those uh, $19 billion are they going to get to uh, bump up the tourism and to brainwash the locals and the rest of us? Well, they, of course, Ogilvy Mather was, uh, they, 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 have a, they have a vested interest in, you know, seeing uh, seeing a bump in tourism, they have, uh, they, they have managed BP America's, uh, uh, Facebook site, uh, you know, where, you know, there, there's somebody, they, there's, there's somebody in, you know, any time zone, they have somebody, you know, as a moderator, they're all the time, you know, getting, uh, getting rid of negative commentary. Um, you know, so they, they I mean, they, 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 they have their hooks very deep into this. Um, <clears throat> as far as the, uh, as far as the the, the, the tourism draw, um, the, at this point in time, um, you know they, they can they, you know they, they can keep running the ads. Hey, let's come to the Gulf. Uh, you know it's you know it's basically like you know the mayor and draws. You know as you can see, it's a beautiful day. The beaches are open. You know it, it's it kind of at this point sells itself anymore. Uh, in 2010, 2011, and, and you know arguably 2012. Those were the most important years for Ogilvy and each of the states, especially Florida, uh, which, you know, gets, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, tourist revenues are, are, are 70, 70 billion dollars a year. It's one of the most popular destinations on the planet. Um, 
And you also have to bear in mind that, that in Florida, Florida was hit late. Uh, it was hit after, uh, by and large, was hit after the Unified Command was uh, stopped flying its Corexit sorties. Um, it was, uh, you know, illness, uh, Corexit washups, oils in the oil in the water over there. Uh, didn't happen until after the, after, you know, NBC, CNN, uh, and all the other big news agencies had, had, had long decamped from this area. Um, and, uh, you know, Florida has also been very cautious in, you know, making, uh, requests to BP for damages. Um, you know, they, there, there've been, you know, a lot of, uh, property damage, uh, or prior, how shall we say, uh, uh, suits for, uh, uh, drops in business, uh, due to a negative perception of Gulf seafood and that sort of thing. And so, you know, a lot of people in, uh, in some fairly unexpected places where the oil, as I say, was not officially uh, to have hit, uh, you know, are getting checks for, for damaged business. Um, but, as far as the tourism thing goes, I mean, on a state by state business, when you, uh, a basis, uh, there was, you know, Florida got a lot of money from BP to launch a gigantic campaign. Um, uh, Mobile, Alabama, uh, had, uh, um, uh, and, 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 and Mobile Bay had somewhere in the, somewhere in the field of, you know, 10 million visitors in the, tw in, in, in the 2010, se uh, to, to, uh, 2010 season after the oil spill, uh, in the summer, um, which means that you had 10 million people flying in from Minnesota, Washington, uh, the East Coast, uh, et cetera, uh, who were all exposed to this mess. Um, and, you know, who knows what sort of condition they're in. Uh, but, uh, the tourism, it's, you know, it, it, when, when people say that tourism is kind of back to where it used to be, they're right. Um, and you know, it, it, that holds true for most of the Gulf states, except for Louisiana, when you start getting down into places like, uh, Grand Isle, Venice, uh, Elmer Island, uh, Barataria Bay, et cetera which are still just perpetually, because of their proximity to the Macondo well, uh, are perpetually, on any rainy day, hit by oil slick. Um, so those are, places that have, that, those are places that have completely died off as, 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 as tourist destinations. Uh, you go down to Grand Isle, which is you know, basically a, a community of houses up on, uh, up on stilts for, you know, hurricane waters and that sort of stuff, but which used to be a, uh, you know, which used to be a, uh, an absolute magnet for, uh, for, for tourist fishing charters and, and people who, you know, who lived in New Orleans or farther north, uh, you know, to keep little fishing cabins and that sort of stuff. Every, I, 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 the last time I was there, which was not too long ago, probably about three, four months ago, um, every third house is up for sale and others are just empty and abandoned. Um, so that's Louisiana. But when you look at Mississippi, uh, when you look at, uh, Alabama and you look at Florida and then you, 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 you go, out, go over into the other side of the spill into Texas. Uh, you're still you're you're seeing you're you're seeing tourist revenue uh, getting back to what it was before uh, 2010. Yeah, they managed that in Japan, uh, WPP, uh, ugly uh, matter. So, yeah. um, but I was going to say now, obviously, you've got the activists that are fighting this on the ground, mm -hmm. and and you were telling me a, a little story earlier about um, what's been happening to them in terms of. Uh, harassment and uh, who's doing it and could you could you fill us in a little bit about that sure um a lot of the uh uh what i, I can sort of take the case of a couple of uh specific activists um one who i mentioned earlier uh trisha springstead who is a uh she's a registered nurse uh and uh from uh from the tampa area and has since uh since 2010 devoted uh her her all of her time uh to raising uh public awareness of the health issues um she has been variously pulled over for dwis 
uh, which are bogus, uh, so that she could be separated from her cell phone. Uh, she's been stalked online. Uh, she's been arrested for various other things and then let go, uh, only to find that her, her, all, all of her computer accounts have been hacked. Uh, she's had, uh, you know, vans parked out in front of her house. Uh, she's been followed to interviews with, uh, with sick fishermen. Uh, she's been, um, uh, uh, the IRS has come after her. Um, uh, she's been, uh, uh, the, uh, it's, it, 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 uh, it, the, 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 the butt of jokes and sort of a fit on, on official, uh, on, a, on, on official government, uh, or an official like state government sites. Uh, and, um, she's been, uh, you know, she's really, she, she's, you know, she's, she's poured, you know, blood, sweat and tears into, uh, as I say, raising awareness and, and, and basically treating people medically for free out of her own pocket. Uh, and, uh, has been, you know, tarred and feathered and, and, and not necessarily media, but by, by the scientific community here, uh, along the Gulf. Um, and there, you know, you have a very, you have a very clear divide between, uh, the scientific community that's independent, which trusts the information that she brings, that she brings them and the, those who have received, you know, early on received the BP grants. Um, but a lot of those guys are in charge. A lot of those guys are, uh, a lot of those guys are, are, are sort of the more vocal voices, uh, who say, you know, once again, come on down. The water's fine. I don't know why everybody's so worried. Uh, the microbes ate everything. Um, we're good. Uh, correct. It's no more dangerous than Don, uh, than, than, than dishwashing soap. Um, uh, there's no correction in the water. Uh, correct. That never did any harm to anybody. Um, the dolphin die off is due to the dolphin flu, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, she's, uh, she, uh, uh, she, she's had some, some creepy instances where she's returned home to find all of her stuff upended. Uh, and files, you know, uh, uh, stolen, swiped, et cetera. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, geez, I mean, we can go on to other activists who, uh, have, uh, you know, they, they, some people who've, 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 uh, uh, done various studies and said, okay, well, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a, a doctor in, uh, or I'm sorry, a veterinarian in, uh, um, and in Florida, who was doing studies on on six wands, determined that they were sick because of the because of Corexit and oil exposure. Uh, all of a sudden, his office is shut down, and nobody's seen him since. Um, you have um, who was the other person I wanted to bring up? Um, uh, there was a, do- a doctor named uh, Rodney Soto. Uh, who was doing, uh, volatile organic compound draws on, uh, people who were exhibiting symptoms, uh, after the spill. Um, you'd go, there was one case where a, a, a five-year-old kid had, he, he hadn't been in the water. He was, his, his, his grandparents were part of, uh, the vessel of opportunity program and doing decommissioning, or I'm sorry, not decommissioning, but rather decontamination on vessels that were coming in that were covered with oil and, you know, pulling oil booms. Uh, their five year old grandson, uh, was inherent, was, was, became violently, violently ill, apparently from inha- inhaling aerosolized, uh, Corexit and crude. Uh, they took him to nine different emergency rooms, excuse me, not nine, six different emergency rooms between, uh, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana and were all turned away. Uh, they, uh, were turned away at each one. They, they, they showed up and, and said, you know, they, they, the first question out of anybody, any doctor's mouth was, do you have a lawyer? Um, and they said, well, yeah, we have a lawyer, but we're, you know, we're just trying to find out what's wrong with our, with our, with our grandson. And, uh, you know, the lawyer thing was what, I mean, they, 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 they'd give him a, they'd give the child an abuterol inhaler and shove him out the door. They didn't want to have anything further to do with it until, you know, this, this guy named, named Dr. Rodney Soto, 
uh, was doing volatile, volatile organic compound draws in Florida, in Tampa. So they went over there to find out. And so uh, find out what what could possibly be in his body that was making it, making him so ill. Uh, it turned out he had very high levels of uh, what was uh, associated with uh, uh, exposure to the oil spill, um, and uh, the, the the child and his family, you know, since relocated to Maine, the kids made a full recovery. Uh, but Dr. Soto was hounded out of Florida. Um, and he's, he's sort of, he's got a very small practice now in Alabama. Uh, but he was, uh, he was basically ejected by the, uh, uh, the, the, the Florida board of, uh, uh, the, the Florida medical board, uh, for conducting these tests. Um, they did not want <laughs> somebody in their state saying, well, the, the oil spill might be making people sick. Um, you have uh, any number of other people. There, there was a, the, 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 you know, an amazing resource for this is a is a group called uh, the Government Accountability Project, uh, which is a whistleblower protection organization here in the United States, based out of Washington D.C. And I've worked uh, uh, with. Uh, 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 their legislative director, Sh- Shanna Devine, whose work has to be, you know, I, I have to mention that, uh, just as a, a, an advertisement for her because she's worked very hard to secure, uh, uh, legal affidavits from people who have been both, uh, uh, uh become ill because of the oil spill and also been harassed. Um, uh, one of her, one of, one of her interviewees who I also interviewed, uh, was a, was a decontamination worker in, uh, Louisiana who just felt that the way the operation was happening was, was fishy. You know, people were supposed, she read the safety sheets. She knew that she was supposed to be wearing a respirator, but there weren't any respirators on site. She knew that she was supposed to be wearing hazmat gear, but there wasn't any hazmat gear around. Um, she mentioned this to her supervisor. Uh, the supervisors took away, uh, uh, took away the safety sheets and said, don't worry about it. Uh, and she, 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 she was determined to complain to a higher, a higher authority, which was a subcontracted, um, a subcontracted organization of BP. Uh, and on the way to, on the way from the little bayou community, uh, where she was working in New Orleans, somebody ran her car off the road. Uh, it was a van that she identified as being one that belonged to the subcontracting agency. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of harassment that people had to endure. Uh, and, you know, during the spill itself and post spill, uh, journalists too have been targeted for, uh, any kind of coverage, really. Um, you know, my, my mailbox gets filled every time I, I, I publish an article about it. Well, just, just, but we, we, uh, we could go on for hours. So I just wanted to cover Fukushima, which you know about and loads of other things, but I don't <laughs> think we're going to get there this time. Um, <laughs> but, but what I would say, what I would say, there's two things that I, I, I just point out is that, you know, we in Europe think, oh, that's over there. And mm-hmm. we've got the Atlantic Eel in t- 2014. Um, which was basically put on the extinction list. And it, it wasn't 2008 as well, but it, it recovered. And then in 2014, it's been put back on it. And I would just say that we were talking um, uh, about this uh, and we we, did, we were discussing the fact that there's no uh, uh, sort of uh, research that we know of that's being done on these, uh, these issues. The Atlantic Eel is well covered, so we're aware of what's going on there. But certainly we don't know if there's uh, a contamination from the Gulf causing this problem or if it's making its way over to Europe into the uh, larvae, uh, the eelets, you know, the, where the eels uh, <coughs> uh, basically uh, come to um, um, uh, mate and what have you. So the bottom line is uh, what, what uh, I think I'd, what I'd like to get out of you now is that you, you did mention, you know, the, the mechanism for all this spying on all these, these activists uh, was G4S and uh, would you just like to quick 
sort of kind of round up with maybe a little bit of a statement on on uh, on their sort of uh, um, we've talked about WPP doing the PR management uh, but they need uh, data they need information and they need to keep a track of all these activists to be able to manage the the meme that they put out in the papers and the TV so uh, where does G4S fit into all this? G4S uh, and the and during the spill, um, the uh, their I guess their their now subsidiary division Wackenhut uh, was responsible for all of the security, uh, responsible for keeping journalists off beaches, uh, responsible for keeping activists off beaches, um, was responsible for uh, detaining people, following people. Uh, swiping their cell phones, uh, posing as cops and pulling them over, uh, often uh, holding them in jail cells for uh, or turning them over to local police, and and, and hold. They, they were essentially given the they were essentially given the power of law enforcement agents, um, and said on any number of occasions uh, that they were operating under you know they'd been deputized by the the U.S. Coast Guard. So you know not only did they have law enforcement powers, but they also had federal law enforcement powers. Now, the Coast Guard denies that they were ever deputized, but the fact remains that they were, in fact, they were, in fact, on contract to Unified Command, uh, which uh, was a joint operation between uh, BP, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, the NOAA, the EPA, and uh, the FDA. Um, <clears throat> which was the, the Unified Command, of course, was the one that was busy for calling the shots on how, how the cleanup operation was handled. Um, so, you know, that, that, that involved, uh, that involved, uh, G4S people out there making sure that people weren't getting onto the beaches to see what was going on. Uh, public beaches, uh, beaches that were part of state parks, uh, beaches that are completely, entirely, utterly open to the public. Um, that people had a right to see. Um, they also maintained uh, security for all of BP's cleanup products, etc., um, and uh, uh, were uh, uh, the basic the, the the first line of intimidation uh, between uh, anybody wishing to know what was going on. Uh, and, uh, those who were wishing to conceal what was going on. Uh, I recall that during my, my coverage of the spill, I was followed by, uh, uh, unmarked, uh, they, they, they used white pickup trucks to follow people around. Uh, we were tailed for <laughs> 40 days. Uh, you know, they'd park in front of our house, uh, or wherever we'd, you know, hole up. Uh, to, uh, you know, be, you know, if we were away from our, our base of operations, they would, you know, they, 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 they uh, you'd find, you know, two or three of their, 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 uh, uh, their, uh, their trucks out in the parking lot in the motel, uh, uh, uh each morning. Um, they, uh, have an extraordinarily long history, uh, with BP. Uh, they, they were a part of, uh, the spying and discrediting of environmentalists, uh, during the Alaska pipeline, uh, leak in 1989. Uh, and they were actually taken to court over and, and taken to court and successfully sued for invasion of privacy, uh, for trying to, uh, discredit a, uh, a local environmentalist who was pointing out problems in uh, uh, the uh, Alaskan oil pipeline, uh, of which BP was a majority owner. Um, uh, these guys, uh, during, during that particular time, uh, they went through uh, this environmentalist's trash. They uh, uh, would send subtle threats about uh, his, you know, knowing where his children went to school, uh, they uh, would ransack his house. Uh, they would set up uh, other uh, sort of phony front environmental organizations to try to draw information out of him and figure out what he knew. Uh, and I mean, they really put a lot of money into this. This one guy. 
um, uh, who had the goods. I mean, who had who had a few, you know, engineering notational issues with the the with the Alaskan pipeline, um, and uh, you know they even hired uh, they even hired sort of like you know a, a, a attractive. Uh, you know, women to chat them up into a bar in, in bars to, you know, I don't know, either discredit him as somebody who slept with prostitutes or to see what kind of information they could get out of him. Um, that that was something we saw, uh, you know, according to uh, according to my own observations and according to, to Dr. Ricky Yacht's observations, something we saw time and again uh, along the Gulf. Now, uh, the difference between what happened in Exxon Valdez and Prince William Sound and what happened here during the uh, during the uh, 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 BP spill is that you had the, is, was the advent of social media. Uh, you know, people with cell phones who could go on and tweet immediately that they were being arrested or they were being followed by. Uh, or that they, you know, they returned home to find their house ransacked, or uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but you know, as they say, you know, you're still dealing with a fairly loose community, and that's why, you know, that's why they were so so tech obsessed. Uh, that's why, you know, there was, you know, patchy at best sort of cell phone reception if you're on the 4G networks around here uh, at that particular time. Uh, that's why uh, the the, you know, the the communities still re remain the communities of of, of sick people uh, and of people who have been affected by the still spill still remain very very isolated. Uh, the intimidation worked. Um, you know when you uh, when 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 you, you go and find that the brakes to your car have been uh, meddled with. Uh, when you go and find your cell phone that it was, you know, taken away from you by, uh, you know, somebody posing as a police officer has been completely wiped clean or switched out. Uh, when you find that all of your personal information is now available online for anybody to take, um, uh, and your address has been published and that sort of thing so that, you know, anybody who's, you know, uh, you know, which is you know an extraordinarily intimidating thing. Um, that that that's that's essentially what they were doing. They were, you know, they were following around news crews. Following around, there was a there was an event we had uh, on the. It was a, 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 a well documented one where uh, a lot of you know a lot of major networks and uh, myself uh, myself and other you know print journalists etc. We're on a boat trying to get to um, uh, one of the barrier islands that had been, you know, slimed with oil. Uh, we were stopped by a Coast Guard vessel driven by a guy wearing a G4S uniform uh, who said that on the authority of the Coast Guard, he, he could sink us if, he, if we attempted to approach the beach. Um, you know, to which, well, it's a public beach. You, you know, on whose authority are you acting? You, you have a, you have a G4S, uh, 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 uniform on. Uh, therefore, you know, you don't have these, you don't, you, you don't have federally endowed powers to do this. But according to the, you know, according to them, the Coast Guard gave them to them. Um, you know, it's yeah, G. I mean, G for us, Wackenhut, et cetera, down here in the south. They've got a. They they have quite a presence. They run a lot of. Uh, they run a lot of private prisons. Uh, they run uh, a lot of private juvenile facilities, uh, which is even more disturbing because on a yearly basis, uh, you know, any of the juvenile facilities, uh, um, you can just kind of follow along. Uh, on the uh, the incarceration facilities that they're using, or that they're running, excuse me, which should be run by state governments, not private, not a private corporation. Uh, the number of the number of abuse uh, comments, uh, not comments, but uh, complaints uh, arising from the inmates, um, and of course, you know, they like to keep them keep them filled at full capacity because you know, they, I mean, the more, the more prisoners they have, the more money they get. So, um, in any case, yeah, they're, they were, uh, you know, and they're, you know, there's, they, it's, they, they, even though, uh, even though, um, uh, BP's comment to me about their associations with G4S and, and Wackenhut, uh, were that, you know, of course, we never, 
uh, we never ask them to to do any uh, to do anything wrong, and any implication that they're uh, they were engaged in wrongdoing is is simply uh, uh, is, is, is 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 simply uh, uh, you know outrageous. Uh, why don't we just? I mean, all we have to do really is trace their history back to the, the history of their relationship all the way back to 1989 and in, in, in Alaska. Where they were, where they were very actively harassing, openly harassing environmentalists, and you know, following boats for, uh, and, 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 and even uh, you know, during the Exxon Valdez spill, they were doing the same thing. Every time scientists would go out in boats, they, they, you know, a bunch of whack and hut and G4S guys would jump in boats and follow them, right. and to find out what was going on. So you know, I mean, that was something that Ricky Ott was very involved in. I mean, she said just just kind of tracking the people that were tracking them. You know, and there was nothing that she could do with that G4S, uh, uh, and, and or representative, you know, subcontracting companies, uh, coming out and finding it, you know, trying to, trying to, fi trying to figure out what they were discovering and trying to discredit what they were discovering. Right. Well, um, that's, that's fantastic. I, I suppose we'll have to ro round it up here. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll let Jimmy uh, round it up and uh, see if he's yep. got any, anything to say on, on the matter and what have you. So, uh, look, thanks a lot, Charles. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully you'll come back to the show again. Uh, sure, and it's been a pleasure, and I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> Well, thanks very, very much, Charles. And just one small little observation uh, in connection with the, uh, with the restoration of the fisheries. And the and the wetlands, and it, it it just seems to me that unless the source of future pollution is of potential future pollution is dealt with, like there's no point in trying to restore fisheries if you're still going to be getting uh, oil spills coming in due to freak hurricanes or even just Cat One hurricane. So it was just a small little observation I made. But thanks very very much for coming on and sharing this hour and a bit with us. Absolutely, Jimmy. It's been my pleasure.